Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is Byron. I'm here with my buddy Gary. Today we have an interview with Stefan Kesti. Gary, how excited yes. are you for this interview? I am very excited. Uh, I've, I've uh, watched uh, Stefan Kesti's videos uh, from basically when I first started Jiu-Jitsu, so uh, he's been a big influence on my game, so uh, can't wait for the interview. Yep. Uh, just real quick here, he does have a website, grapplearts.com. He's probably... Uh, one of the one of the bigger uh, websites there. He also has a podcast that you can find through there. He also runs uh, beginningbjj.com. dot com. Definitely swing by there. Uh, we'll put links to that in the show notes. But uh, yeah, check him out. You know he's he's a uh, a great resource for uh, people who do uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and and Gi and Ogi or whatever. Uh, he's he's always been one of the guys that's uh, helped us uh, learn uh, from a distance. Yeah, I think uh, just about everybody uh, that's been training Jiu Jitsu for any amount of time has come across his website, Grapple Arts, there, and uh, checked out videos, read uh, articles, and uh, definitely learned from them. Yep. We do. Uh, we talk a lot of jiu-jitsu. I, we're both firefighters. We get a little bit off topic about firefighting, but then we kind of rope it back around. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think it. Uh, we talked a bit about firefighting, but but why not? You know, we're, we're both passionate yeah. about it. It's, a, it's, it's physically demanding. It's, I don't know, there's a lot that we, that could, I don't know, kind of relate, but... Uh, it's not like we talk about it for twenty minutes. So we kind of give it four or five minutes about firefighting, and then we move on to back to jujitsu. So uh, it was fun yeah, talking yeah. with him. I enjoyed it. Yeah, and that's one thing I didn't know about him. I had no clue he was a firefighter. So no matter what, I learned something today. Well, there you go. Always, always learning and and, and always staying sweaty, right, Gary? Staying sweaty and taking showers <laughs> and taking showers. <laughs> mm. All right. Well, let's get on with our uh, quote of the week. We had uh, our last week interview was uh, Frangia or Ricardo Frangia Miller, and he gave us a quote this week. So I'll go ahead and play that. Never give up and believe yourself. The word that reason more is belief. Believe you can do it, and you're going to make it happen. Huh? If you don't believe, it's better than you can try. Do you think that uh, so, doing jujitsu helps people uh, off the mat uh, have m- more confidence and also uh, not give up on things because they're doing uh, jujitsu and it's it's physically a demanding thing? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, like a lot of things you learn on the mat, I mean, you're going to be able to use your personal life, you know. And a lot of lessons you learn on the mat and all that, you're going to sometimes, like, come off a storm, you know, and you're going to find a good position. And that's that's totally life situation. I mean, sometimes you go to hell and suddenly, suddenly say, you know, I cannot be roasting in this. But if you survive here, and I'm going to tap you here. I mean, I get a lot of pressure here. Suddenly you find a position, boom, you change the game. That was our friend Ricardo Frangia Miller uh, with, uh, I don't know, a quote or a piece of advice. Never give up and believe in yourself. And, you know, I like what he, uh, well, actually, you asked the question about, uh, you know, on and off the mat, turning into jiu-jitsu. Has it helped you on and off the mat? And and I think jiu-jitsu has helped myself tremendously off the mat. I just think about how much more confidence I have in, in everything I do. And, I mean, especially work-wise. Um, I remember before, if I got promoted, I would, I'd be terrified, thinking, oh, boy, can I do this? Uh, I don't know if I can do this. And all that self-doubt would run through my head. And today, it doesn't matter what's, what's given to me at work. I, I always just think it's like, man, just from jiu-jitsu has taught me, you know, how to be, uh, as I call it, hard, how to be tough, how to not shy away from stuff, how to attack stuff head on, and uh, not scared of anything. Jiu-Jitsu has, has done a lot for my confidence, not just in my grappling ability, but in my ability as a person. Um, so uh, I, I totally agree with uh, uh, his quote right there. Absolutely. You see you see it, uh, uh, I think, on in a, in a quicker scale with children that, that do Jiu-Jitsu. They come in, they're shy, and they, and they keep to themselves. And after a short amount of time, uh, you see, like a confidence building in them, but that happens with adults too. Um, sometimes life just kind of beats you down, and uh, you know, getting if you haven't started it, and you, you're getting you're trying to just do, and uh, you know, after a little while, it kind of picks you up and uh, and, and gets you that confidence and gets you uh, get you back on your feet, you know. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's uh, 
there's no, in my opinion, I, I really haven't done anything harder. And when I'm out there on the mat and I'm going against, let's say, you or or somebody, you know, high level, it's for just not to quit. I mean, it's just, you can just be getting beat down. You, you know, every time I try to make a move, I'm getting in worse trouble. But, boy, you, you don't give up. It just teaches you to just keep going and uh, and think a ways out. You, you really learn to use your mind and body together. And uh, it's it's just so great of an art. Yeah, tremendous. Uh, if, you get, if you haven't realized it by now, there's great off-the-mat benefits from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and uh, the, the idea that uh, not to give up and to believe in yourself. Uh, those are both going to be enhanced significantly uh, by, by doing your training on the mats. Yep, believe in yourself. Do not give up. Great advice. We got the music rolling in, which keeps us moving right along, Gary. Uh, we've got an article from White Belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or WB bjj.com and I mean this is a great one uh, five difficult concepts for BJJ be- beginners to grasp and uh, and I kind of wish that when I started I had this article to, wa- to not watch to, to read and have somebody uh, uh, explain it to me because uh, once I read this article I was like boy this is a uh, it is difficult to grasp, but it, it's great stuff to uh, to help your BJJ game. And uh, before we get like uh, really start into it, um, BJJ White Belt's hosting uh, hosting this. But I did I clicked on the author, and he's got his own website. Uh, is <laughs> I want to give the guy credit because it's a great article. Joe, as in J O E, and then Joe, as in J O. So Joe Joe nineteen ninety one dot wordpress dot com is where you can find um, this article on the author's website and then he's got a ton of more stuff on here as well so I uh, just want to try to give full credit when we can I'm glad I saw that on there but yeah five yeah back to the actual article <laughs> five concepts Gary what's the first one they've got there uh, first one they got is don't roll over and uh, basically you know, he talks about the first time you know I rolled after I've been doing uh, BJJ for 45 minutes I found myself trying to barrel world to escape a side mount and uh, basically ended up uh, giving his back and then ended up getting rear naked and choked and uh, you know you don't want to give your back up and uh, it's uh, a lot of times if you're mounted or side mount you'll about do anything to get out of that position but uh, you definitely don't want to give your back up yeah great great advice the second uh, piece of advice he has is protect my arms while in someone's guard um it, I think this kind of has two things. Uh, first off, he was he was making mistakes with where he put his arms and where he, what he was grabbing uh, while he was in someone's guard. His instructor came by, uh, saw him doing this, and gave him some advice, and then he took the advice, and it's it's benefiting him. Like that's to me two lessons right there. Hey, be careful with your arms when someone's guard. Uh, that's a huge factor whether you're going to get arm barred or swept or or triangle choked or just submitted. Um, and then when your instructor gives you a little piece of advice or a little correction, take note of that. You know, they're trying to help you. Hey, a little quick story on this one, protecting your arms when you're in the guard. Byron and I started about the same time. And Byron, actually, I had no moves and Byron had one. And Byron's one move was an arm buff from the guard. He was really good at it. And we really didn't know what we were doing too well or our basics weren't there and I used to always just reach I would just like just grab no matter what my arms would be out straight I'd be in your guard I'd be grabbing your your collar you know makes no sense what I was doing it's just nobody really corrected me and Byron would arm bar me left and right and uh, I'd go home every night I'd put a bag of peas on my arms because they would hurt and one of our previous guests uh, was out of he, he had trained in Wichita for a while, and then he moved, and he came back, and it was the first time I met him. Uh, Black Belt Jason Burchard out of Kansas City Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, he came in, and he, he's watching me roll with Byron, and my arms are way out there. And uh, he's like, Gary, what are you doing? He's, and I'll never forget, he looks at me, he's like, T-Rex arms, keep your arms like this. And uh, just that one little advice, just like the instructor did there, Jason gave me that one little advice, and, and I probably very rarely been on board from the guard since then but it was just something somebody needed to show me byron was my number one training partner but he probably really didn't know what what we were doing at that time either um, so i just listened to my instructor at that day and uh, jason thank you jason he helped me out yep and and it was gary that took the advice you've I, undoubtedly there's times people give uh you advice on or off the mat and 
and I don't take it. Like, he's just, oh, okay. And, or it doesn't sit well, or it wasn't communicated well with urgency, maybe, but it would have helped me tremendously. So, um, the, the seizing that opportunity or of knowledge that you did and, and you took it, that, that was good for you. Gary, what's the third yeah. one on the list? Third one is going on the offense way too early. And I think we've all been guilty of that. But, you know, you go to class, you learn a new choke or a new arm bar, and you're so excited to try it. As soon as you start rolling, you're trying to hook it up from everywhere without totally uh, uh, getting your position. You know, as we always say, submission before position. So, you know, you're you're half mounted, you're half where you need to be and you're going forward and you end up losing position, you lose control and you end up, uh, you know, getting reversed. So, uh, uh, make sure when you're trying a new move, you, you drill it a lot. You've got a great understanding of it and you solidify your base or position before going for it. That's quality advice there. The fourth one on the list is pushing and pulling. And then he goes in to describe what that means. He tells us this situation where he's in sight control and he's pushing and pulling and trying to get his uh, teammate off of him and it doesn't work. Two minutes later, exhausted and still in the same spot. So that didn't, the pushing and pulling didn't really benefit him at all. And it's, I think he's just trying to say, try to try to think about what you're doing don't just uh, easy word is like a spaz don't just spaz out because that's gonna make you tired he, uh he's got to um learn an escape or two from each position and then go to work towards that it still may not work when you have somebody who's uh, got significant more training than you but it's gonna get you something to work on and it will eventually work for you once you've uh, really figured out the finer details of the escape yep so true um and number five is thinking it, thinking a tap means I'm good. And we've all been in that situation. We tap somebody out that we might be physically stronger or bigger than with very poor technique. Uh, and I can think of my very first tap. My very first tap, I was in somebody's guard, and I did a can opener. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was cool. It's like, come on, tap somebody out with a can opener because I was stronger than that person. That uh, is terrible, but just... You know, really, you can overpower some people. You can use terrible technique, you know, and you can make something work. But it doesn't mean you're good. You're going to go out there with somebody with some... You're going to be stronger than, bigger than. The person with some more skill is, is just going to tool you on the mat. You're going to get swept left and right. You're going to be the one tapping. So just because you tap somebody out does not mean you're good. So uh, uh, don't go writing about it on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> And, and just on a side note there, uh, that was the last day Gary was allowed in the kids' class after he can open her that kid. Yeah. But, hey, that three-year-old was pretty good. <laughs> and I know he could do like three or four push-ups. Well, he he, got, he made you frustrated because he kept choking you, so you he just had to go for the can opener there. Hey, you know, I was going on the offensive too early. I was pushing and pulling. I wasn't protecting my arms, and I was always rolling over. There you go. a lot of things on. So uh, just some advice, especially if you're new or um, or helping coach somebody new. It's it's a helping uh, coach somebody who's new. It's a whole different world for them to kind of get on the mat and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, maybe share the article with them. This article is written by Joe Thorpe. He has his own website, JoJo. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. JoJo1991. dot wordpress. dot com, and uh, he's got articles about other things. And he's uh, a freelance journalist based in London. So he's he's doing. Uh, He's he's fairly new to jiu jitsu, it sounds like, but uh, he's learning a lot and he's sharing what he's le- he's learning along with his journey. So that's fun. But uh, we did find the article on BJ, white belt BJJ. So I'll put links to everything. There's going to be so many links in this web on this uh, uh, show notes. Gary, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> you're going to be all linked out when you're done with this show. Yep. Uh, before we get started on the interview, we do have a way you could help support the podcast. If you want to help keep us going, um, we have an audiobook for sale. It's uh, it'll help you through your first year of BJJ. It's uh, basically uh, two and a half hours of, of me kind of coaching you and, and helping you what to expect uh, while you're on the mat. So your first year, um, you can check us out. Go to the show notes or just go to the website and you'll find a link to it. Um, it's pretty simple. I mean, if you like this you know podcast type of uh, format here, that's basically what you get. It's eleven ninety nine and the money will go to help support the show. So we definitely appreciate that, and it's also encouraging to get uh, positive feedback from that. 
Yeah, definitely. You know, there's six chapters. Uh, chapter one is finding the right GM for you. Chapter two, your first month in BJJ. Chapter three, benefits of BJJ. Chapter four, a great one here, techniques and positions to focus on. Uh, chapter five, your training is schedule. And chapter six is tournament. So uh, uh, Byron gives you a lot of great advice, uh, something uh, I think we could all use. And, and like you said, it's uh, only $11.99. Uh, so definitely check it out. Yeah, good way to support the show. If you want to make sure you don't miss a show, um, a newsletter sent out every Tuesday. Um, basically, you just uh, enter your email address, uh, your first and last name, and uh, uh, you can either get it in HTML or text, and uh, we'll send it to you so you'll never miss a show. And you also get a, a free gift, a couple of uh, uh, chapters of an audio book, so, uh, or sound clips there, so definitely check those out. Yep, we, I've got what he's referring to as the audio uh, stuff. There is at the bottom of the weekly email. There's a, a link to a Dropbox folder. So I've Got to say link again. I should ring a bell every time we say link because I'm saying it like crazy. Yeah, we call it. But there's a link at the, to a Dropbox folder. If you click on that, there's there's half a dozen MP3 files that are uh, jujitsu related or um, something else I've covered and and wanted to share that. Uh, that's available to download there for free. So that's pretty easy. I don't have a better way to get that out, but it seems to be working pretty good. Yes, definitely. <clears throat> Gary, I've got a new social media campaign idea go for for us to help get the word out. Oh, let's hear your new social media campaign. That well, we'll get the word out. Well, uh, kind of going old school on this, but uh, t- tell me if this is a decent plan. If uh, you like the podcast, you could tell somebody at the gym about the podcast. Huh? Yeah, that's old school. Like, like there would be an example of it. Hey, I listened to this podcast about jujitsu. It's called BJJ Brick. And uh, it was pretty entertaining, and I learned something. That's like a conversation you could have with one of your, your uh, training buddies and uh, help uh, get the word out. And that means a lot to us if you're able to, uh, you know, give an p- actual recommendation to a friend. We do appreciate that. I know a lot of people do that. And that's how the show has been able to grow so much so far. Yeah, recommendations are basically your best form of uh, advertising. If if one of your friends likes it and thinks it's beneficial and tells you, you're probably going to check it out. So definitely let your uh, let your friends, training partners, uh, your dog, if your dog likes jujitsu, let let everybody know uh, that you like the BJJ Break podcast and tell them about it. Yeah, it means a lot to us when you recommend us. Uh, we don't always know because it's you know we're not there and we don't necessarily see it online. But uh, but uh, if you Word of mouth is great, and we do appreciate it. So that means a lot to us. All right, Gary, I think we've wrapped up the, the front half of the show, or the front third. Uh, we'll play the interview, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit at the end. Yeah, definitely time. Let's uh, let's talk to Stefan Casting. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He does the barambolo while passing your guard. He is known for a lightning-fast gi choke that he only does in no gi. His triangle choke has four sides. One of his cauliflower ears was eaten by a vegetarian. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Stefan Kesting to the BJJ Break podcast. Stefan, thanks for jumping on the line with me. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Byron. Uh, you are well known in the jiu-jitsu community for uh, teaching uh, jiu-jitsu, you know, on all aspects. You know, you've got uh, a great newsletter that comes out all the time, and uh, you've got – anytime I type in a technique and I want to learn it, you're the one teaching me, it seems like, and – and you just got uh, tons of information out there. Uh, could you just kind of introduce yourself a little bit to the to the audience that may have not uh, found you yet? Oh wow! Um, well, I guess I've been doing martial arts a long time. You know, I I, uh, I still remember being I think eight years old and being in a uh, supermarket with my mom and seeing a book called Ninja Clan of Death. <laughs> it was the coolest <laughs> thing I had ever seen. So there's some dude in a black suit with a sword and uh so i begged and pleaded and somehow i don't know how i got her to buy it but she bought it and uh, <laughs> how old were you sent me. i was eight okay eight that's funny old. yeah okay right on sorry um 
uh, yeah, that pretty much sent me down the rabbit hole. I did a, <laughs> there was uh, a few um, uh, wrong turns in the way, you know, I wanted to become a Kung Fu Grandmaster and, uh, you know, leap tall walls in slow motion and, you know, dim mock and all that kind of stuff. But uh, eventually I found my way to sort of the more, I don't want to say reality-based martial arts, I want to say the martial arts that you can actually test out to find, you know, whether it works, as opposed to being told by your sifu or your sensei that, you know, this technique is so deadly that it'll, uh, you hit the guy here and you hit the guy here and the guy's heart will stop, but you have to take my word for it because, you know, it, it's based on meridians and, uh, and chi and, uh, and, and mystic harmonic resonances moving towards martial arts where you can actually test it out. So, you know, instead of um, doing hopping around, waving a sword in the air, doing kung fu forms, doing full contact uh, Filipino stick fighting, dog brother style, instead of uh, jumping around, looking, you know, trying to look like a crane or like a tiger, you know, using your tiger claw technique, doing boxing and kickboxing and actually getting punched in the face. And then this leading almost inevitably to jiu-jitsu and grappling. So I guess I've been doing martial arts for, depending how you count it, somewhere in the realm of 35 years, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. Yeah. And grappling in its entirety for 25 years although judo was one of my first martial arts, so that had a little bit of exposure there right in the beginning. And then, I, like I said, I went down some rabbit holes. And Brazilian jiu-jitsu for uh, just under 20 years, formally. Wow. So, so yeah, it, uh, I, I still enjoy it. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't keep doing it. Yeah, that, that, uh, I think that's common for all of us. If you don't in, enjoy... Uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's, it's very difficult to, to want to do it. I mean, you're always uncomfortable. You're always, uh, you know, struggling with your opponent. And if you can't find fun in that, it's, you're not going to stick with it. Uh, you, so you were one of the early adopters. You started, you see, about 20 years ago. Well, I, I think it was... Um, we were training uh, in Montreal at the time, doing a hard style of Kempo Karate called Kaju Kembo with Philip Jelena, who's still teaching, and still teaching a variety of martial arts there. And we got our hands on the first Gracie in Action videos, right? The VHS tape. Yeah. And we didn't learn much from them. We learned that basically, in a real fight, it's, there's a really good chance it's going to go to the ground if one person's determined to take it to the ground and that it's better to be on top than on bottom. I think that was the sum total of what we learned from <laughs> Gracie in Action 1. But then after class, after we beat the crap out of each other uh, doing hard style kaju kembo, which means that you're punching and kicking each other as hard as you can in the stomach while you're doing techniques cooperatively and you know, hitting in the, fit, in the safer parts of the body, condition yourself. And it, it, it's pretty rough and tumble. Yeah. We would then continue with uh, grappling, free grappling. And again, we didn't have a whole lot of techniques. I'd done some judo. Uh, Philip had done some wrestling. There was some classical jiu-jitsu in the mix. We, there were some submission techniques that we had learned. Danny Nasanto was coming to Montreal semi-regularly, and he was beginning to introduce the shoot wrestling or the shoot boxing that was beginning to come out of Japan sort of the early precursor of pancreation. So taking little bits of information, there's a group of five or six of us, and sometimes other people would join in, and we basically, you know, <laughs> complete with finger pulling and hair pulling, <laughs> and eye gouging, and sometimes biting. We would uh, we'd be rolling, and it still was, you know. We didn't know what we were doing technically, but, you know, there's only so many ways to twist an arm. There's only so many ways to stabilize a top position. And you're still developing that kinesthetic sense and kind of uh, getting rid of that claustrophobia that you feel when you're grappling and just becoming used to the sensations. It, it, it's, grappling isn't inherently painful, 
it's just different, right? I mean, I, yeah. When somebody does a heavy, when a power lifter does a heavy, heavy deadlift, he feels pain, but he's used to that pain. And when a marathon runner is running for, you know, when he gets to mile twenty, he's in pain, but hopefully he's used to that pain. Now you switch places, you try and get him to do a heavy, heavy deadlift. He's not going to be used to that pain of deadlifting. The deadlifter isn't going to be used to the pain of running for three hours. So it's it kind of desensitizing yourself to a specific set of sensations. So we still learned a lot, and then more and more information came in. You know, Gracie in Action 2 came in. And I think that's when we figured out that if you are on the bottom, you should try and wrap your legs around the guy's back and kind of hold him down in the guard. We didn't know what to do from there, but we knew that that was better than the alternative. <laughs> um and, you know, and then, well, I, I moved on to a different city and started doing judo. And, of course, judo does have an, its Niwaza component, depending on the school that you're going to. And the school that I went to actually did do a lot of groundwork and was fairly open-minded. And and then eventually started training in formal Brazilian jiu-jitsu at the same time, continuing to study the shoot wrestling, shoot boxing with uh, both Danny DeSanto and Eric Paulson and and Oleg Taktarov would come wandering through town every once in a while and teach some sambo. And, yeah, so it, it, that uh, was sort of the trajectory of the early trajectory of the fascination with grappling. It's amazing to compare that, that time to, to now, and, and people have uh, basically limitless resources to, to learn and to train with. Oh, absolutely. I remember one dude, he was richer than all the rest of us. Uh, we would have this um, <laughs> there's a terrible terrible restaurant in the town that I was living in called Uncle Willie's it's kind of like a like a, it's a buff all you can eat buffet but really low grade but we were all poor we were all <laughs> it's, with a name like that it sounds like uh, you're describing it, it, well. it, it it's, it's terrible so we had this thing once a week a group of us somewhere between 10 and 20 of us would get together we'd find a dojo somewhere Somebody would have a key to some school somewhere, some Taekwondo school or Hapkido school or whatever, and we'd train, and we'd show each other the one technique that we'd learned somehow, and uh, then we'd, we'd beat the crap out of each other, and then we'd go to Uncle Willie's for, for dinner. So we were the Uncle Willie's Grappling Association, because there was no <laughs> formal Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in town at all. It was a big city. So there was this one dude who was richer than the rest of us. He was a medical student. He came from money. And I think he bought, I want to say, the Pedro Carvalho VHS set, which was something like three or $400, anyhow. And he would parcel out one technique per week because he wanted to, to you know, be the man. So, you know, like one week he would, like, show a technique and, like, and they're like, well, what's next? Oh, I can't show you that. <laughs> you lend me the tapes? Go screw yourself. You know, it, uh, um, and it, it was such a, uh, poverty based mentality, really. Uh, you know, and eventually there was a blue belt in town. Oh my God, this guy actually had a real life blue belt. And as it turns out, he became one of my teachers. Um, I'll throw a shout out to Shemek, uh, Shemek Krupchinsky, who's now living in the Los Angeles area. And, you know, you, I, I still think that you can learn a lot from a good blue belt. And Shemek was a really good blue belt. But at the time, to have a blue belt in town was, was you know, a huge opportunity. And so he opened a school. And I started training there. And, uh, you know, eventually I started training with, with the black belt, Marcus Suarez, and you know, learned even more, but um, it, it was a different time. There were also, you know, the YouTube, the YouTubes weren't out there. And so now I think that the question has changed from a, an issue of content being the rate limiting step to context. If, if you're trying to learn a new, and if you type in how to pass the guard into YouTube or into Google, your problem is not finding an answer. Your problem is figuring out which answer is relevant to you. Yeah. Your problem is figuring out of these hundred million ways to pass the guard. Uh, you know, is this guy a clown or is this guy legit? Is this guy's body so different from mine that what he can do I can't? 
is this an advanced technique? Is this a basic technique? Is this well taught? Is this poorly taught? Because all those things are out there. There are, there are a ton of terrible ways to pass the guard shown online. Right? Some karate school rediscovers that uh, the upward rising block can be used to pass the guard. And this is really what the founder of their karate system meant to show <laughs> when, <laughs> when he was putting these kata together 200 years ago. Uh, as if. Um, so now it's, it's the context is more of a question. You know, which of these many, many methods of passing the guard should I start with? Which are legitimate methods? Which are and and what are what are the important points? So I, I think that it can still be tricky to learn jiu-jitsu, but it's changed. The, the parts that are tricky about it have, have changed a little bit. But ultimately, ultimately, it comes back down to people taking responsibility for their own training and going and actually training it. Not, you know, for each, for each hour that you're watching on YouTube, you should probably be spending two hours on the mat. And I think sometimes it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. As, as somebody that, uh, that has a lot of quality uh, instructionals online, how, how important is still the role of the, the coach that's in the gym, you know, to help, help guide that student about what they should be doing and, and, and help fine-tune their game? Well, I think different people learn in different ways, right? Uh, the role of the coach might be... Um, but there, there are many important roles that the coach has. For one, not everybody learns visually, and the vast amount of information on uh, the Internet is visual, right? YouTube. Yeah. So what if you need to feel a technique? What if you need to have a technique explained to you? Uh, what if you need to uh, have somebody guide you through? No, 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 no. Put your shoulder here. There's a, a world of difference between <laughs> a technique that's applied correctly and incorrectly, and it can look almost exactly the same, but then you feel how the person puts way more weight against you know, this part of your leg, and all of a sudden you can't breathe. And, but you can't feel that on the Internet. So sometimes it, it, uh, sometimes there are ways to explain this using teaching methods uh, online. But, but um, I think it's really important to have somebody to feel it, somebody to offer to feel it from, somebody to offer feedback, right, that real-time feedback, somebody to provide context, like, you know, for God's sake, don't try, you know, don't start with a cartwheel guard pass, right? <laughs> let's start with, let's start with a Toriando. Let's start with, you know, a, an over-under pass, you know, and then once you have that, then you can work your cartwheel guard pass. Also, I think coaches are really, really important in, okay, I don't think coaches are the most important thing. I actually think your training partners are more important. Okay. I think I think having a really positive training group and having a bunch of people whose interests are aligned with yours are really important. If you want to be the next UFC champion, you better be at a gym where there's a whole bunch of alpha males beating the crap out of each other, but hopefully not injuring each other too badly, pushing each other. If you want to be the next uh, world champion at the Mundials, you better be in a really good training environment with a lot of high-level guys. You better, you know, if you're in a small town, I'm sorry to say, you better move to a big town. You better move to one of the big clubs where there's a ton of new high-level people coming through all the time. If, if you're at a club where... People don't care about their training partners. You're going to get hurt, right? I think that's that's the. I think having a, a supportive train. I'm 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 becoming much more selective about who I train with as I become older and as I spend more time in the sport, right? I mean, I've got a lot of injuries, as does anybody who's been doing the same thing for 25 years. And you know, I, I don't want to get um, have some cheap shot. Uh, delivered to me by some guy who's like, you know, we're rolling half speed and all of a sudden he goes from 
50% to 125% and applies like, oh, I didn't know we weren't allowed to do heel hooks in the gi. Uh, so I think, <laughs> ironically, the coach, and I have been heel hooked in the gi a couple of times, and it's fucked, you know, and both times my leg was damaged. Um, and I think the coach is ultimately responsible for creating the training environment. And so this is, I think, the most important role of a coach, really, because it's top down. If he's an arrogant prick who doesn't care about other people and the only thing he cares about is whether or not the students come home with a gold medal at the tournament then that's then people are going to take his cue he's going to attract people like that who, who are going to assemble at that club and he's not going to get rid of people who act counter to that so I think ironically the most important role of the coach is almost like a social manager you know, keeping people in line, like, hey, what you just did there was not cool. We don't do X, Y, Z at that school. We don't use neon face uh, for people who are 50 pounds less than us yeah. have two weeks in the sport. But if you wanted to create the toughest club of killers ever, then, you know, go ahead. Neon face all day long, and the people who stay will be tougher than uh, the people who would stay if you didn't allow neon face versus newbies on day one so um so i think ironically the role of the coach is first and foremost social uh, social manager secondly is provider of context and provider of information and thirdly there's the individualized thing like okay uh, you know byron your body's different from this other person you can't put both your legs behind your own head therefore maybe rubber guard shouldn't be the first thing that you work on yeah, <laughs> that's uh, a good way to sum up the role of the coach. You mentioned earlier the uh, you could learn a lot from a blue belt. What would be, uh, at, like at your school, a role that you would look for a blue belt to take to help it, help out the team? Hmm. Well, I mean, first and foremost is take care of the white belts, um, right? And yeah. Because the white belts all want to be blue belts. So who are they? You know, maybe a black belt is, is so uh, such a distant goal. They're not thinking about that, really. They're thinking about the blue belt. So, And they're going to be, you know, realistically, they're mostly going to be rolling with other blue belts, purple belts, and white belts. So their role is to be a good training partner. Their role is to help out when they can. And, um, you know, I think you can learn an awful lot from... Uh, from your training partners, in terms of me learning from a blue belt, a good blue belt, and certainly a good purple belt, will be able to do something that I can't, right? He'll have some special technique that he's better at than I am. There's, I mean, jiu-jitsu is so gigantic. There's so many submissions, so many techniques, so many transitions. There's going to be some point where Maybe it's really tough to armbar. And if I can see what he's doing, if, he, if he'll share with me what he's doing, oh, yeah, anytime you come to side mount, I turn just like this, and I make, in my head, I'm keeping, you know, I'm, here's what I'm thinking of when I'm, I'm in the bottom of side mount so that I can't get armbarred. That's a valuable thing. Um, I'm not the only person to discuss this. I just interviewed on my own podcast Bernardo Faria, double gold world champion. I know you've interviewed him as well, Byron. And he says, you know, that he can learn from a blue belt. So if somebody who's won a gold medal at the highest event of the sport in his own weight division and in the absolute says that you can learn from a blue belt, then, well, that, that pretty much settles it, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think by the time you put a couple years into the school, you should be able to you know, whatever that school culture is, you, you're you're sort of responsible for perpetuating it. You're kind of one of the foot soldiers, <laughs> um, the lower management, and uh, you know you should be you should be helping people. Like at, at the end of a roll, you catch a, a white belt in an armbar three times. You know, like hey, good roll. Uh, listen, when you're in in my guard, don't put your arm like this, because you know you just gave me the armbar three times. Now, maybe maybe the white belt will listen. 
Yeah, they'd be more likely to listen after that lesson than than if you just told them, and they hadn't experienced the armbar multiple times. Mm-hmm. You know, it, there are different school cultures. I've seen like this whole interview is about school culture, but it's really important. You know, there, I've been to schools where when you uh, got armbarred and you ask like, "How do I not get armbarred?" The answer is grow shoulder arms. <laughs> Or, or, or alternately, uh, come and give me a hundred bucks for a private lesson on avoiding arm bars. Wow! <clears throat> so I, I, I think that's complete crap, obviously. Um, and uh, but again, it shows the importance of picking a good school. And if you're an instructor, creating a good school, where the goal is to bring ultimately the best thing you can do to bring your own level up, regardless of whether you're an instructor. Or a brown belt, purple belt, blue belt, is to bring the people beneath you up as fast as you can because then they'll push you harder, right? If a, if a blue belt's goal, to take a white belt and make, give them all the counters they need to shut down that blue belt's techniques, then the blue belt has to evolve, right? If it, he says, okay, don't put your arm like this because I'm just going to arm bar you every time. When the white belt stops putting his arm like that, well, then the blue belt has to figure out a way to force the guy to put his arm like that or trick the guy into putting his arm like that. Or, you know, what can I then do? You know, can I use a, a hip bump sweep so the guy plants his arm and then he puts his arm like that and then I can arm lock him? Can I use a, um, a pendulum sweep and then work into that arm lock? Because the reality is by the time he's a purple belt and he's competing with a purple belt, nobody's going to put their arm like that, yeah. here, please arm bar me. So you, you're going to have to create ways to create that opening anyhow. Uh, so why not start Why not start with the white belt? Why not make that guy better? He'll make you better. And, and uh, a rising tide really does lift all boats in this in this context. Yeah, it's, it seems like if you're at a school and, and they don't want to help you with what uh, is obviously giving you trouble and, or their game is really... Uh, picking you apart with certain areas um the, the student who doesn't want to help is almost saying to themselves or i don't know if they know it or not but this is as good as i am and i don't think i need to get any better than this because exactly the, the learning is really going to stop right there mm-hmm. i completely agree and you see instructors are the same way you see instructors who's you know got their you know black belt 10 years ago and that's it, right? Like, the jiu-jitsu stopped. <laughs> but jiu-jitsu hasn't stopped. Especially if they've got students who are competing. You know, you're doing... You might not like the barambolo. You might hate it. Your body might not be suited for it. You better know how to deal with it. And and really, the best way to know how to deal with it is to play with it and experiment with it yourself. And, uh, um, you know, at least give it a shot. At least know what your... Uh, at least you know, know thy enemy. Yeah. So you have to continue to evolve. You can't be... I mean, that's true in life in general, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I know that you're a firefighter, and I've heard the fire service described as, you know, <laughs> 200 years of tradition unimpeded by any progress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not quite true. You know, we have moved away from leather hoses and horse-drawn carriages and Dalmatians. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, you know, things things do keep keep on evolving, and and you really do have to stay on the cutting edge, or you get left behind. I see I see parallels in the in the fire service uh, that I see in Jiu Jitsu. You mentioned about having videos. Uh, you know, that is the instructor teaching a bunch of crap? Is it not relevant for this person? Is it this or that? You know, I could watch a great video um, about some firefighting technique, and it's not relevant to the city I work in. Or it just doesn't work. It, it, it worked in this one situation, or the person teaching it is selling a product um, that that is probably a bad idea. And, and But uh, it, so you have to put everything, just like in Jiu-Jitsu, through like that filter of, is this right for me? Is it right? Is the person teaching it? Uh, knowledgeable and, and helpful, and uh, I, I see a lot of parallels when I when I do research about firefighting. Um, have you seen that at all? Um, no, I haven't really thought about the parallels between fire. I am 
as well as the a jiu-jitsu guy, a firefighter as well. Um, and I haven't really thought about the parallels of the two other than, again, sort of a social culture element, because, of course, both are an extremely important part of the jiu-jitsu is the culture, and yeah. an extremely important part of the firefighting is the culture. In terms of the the techniques, you're absolutely right, though. There are techniques that are completely applicable in the brownstones of New York that don't really apply in the wood frame buildings of the West Coast, and vice versa. Uh, and in some ways, you know, uh, there's a big argument now in um, the part of the world that I'm in about different types of ventilation, right? Using basically, you have a house full of smoke, so smoke is super poisonous. Smoke kills way more people than fire. Smoke is explosive. You can light it on fire. It happens all the time. And so when you do an attack on a fire in a house, you ideally want to move that smoke out of the house. This is just giving some background to people. Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm not explaining this to you. Obviously, you know this. But so there's all kinds of arguments about how to get that smoke out. Do you put a hole in the roof? Do you use a fan at the front door? How do you use a fan? When do you apply it? How do you position it? And I think the most important thing, really, is that everybody's on the same page because there's nothing worse than some people thinking that you're about to do method A. Method A, B, and C might all work. But if, if half the people think you're using method A and half the people think you're using method B, then you're really setting yourself up for disaster. Yeah. So, and, and of course, it might be a method D, which worked one time and <laughs> is, is being now promulgated by somebody who's trying to, who's got a, you know, money at stake, uh, you know, because they're trying to sell their unique uh, ventilation product, you know. Oh, with this thing, all you need to do is uh, blow bubbles into the interior of the fire, and it'll put it out all by itself. You just need to pay, uh, you know, $400,000 for my unique, uh, you know, bubble generator. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it contact is everything, and ultimately you got to go try it out. Trouble is, people are, that's where we get back to the 200 years of tradition, unimpeded by any progress. People have vested interests in, in doing what they know worked once upon a time. And that's, you take it back to jiu-jitsu. I know this guard pass worked for me when I was a blue belt, purple belt, brown belt. Okay, that's, that's great. But have you learned to adapt that guard pass against the new methods of guard that are coming out. You know, have you have you field tested it? Because the conditions might be changing, right? And in the fire service, conditions are changing all the time, right? The, the fire load in a house is much, much greater than it used to be. And the smoke is much, much more toxic than it used to be. So methods of, you know, 100 years ago, or even not 100 years ago, uh, in the fire department that I used to work in back in the day, so 50 years ago, it was mostly a volunteer department, two guys would pull up to a fire. One guy would put the truck in pump and get water flowing. The other guy would grab a hose line and run into the building, <laughs> holding, holding his breath, and spray water all over the place. Wow. Then he'd come out and puke on the front lawn because he would have taken smoke. second guy would, would grab a hose, would go in, grab the same hose, continue spraying water all around, still not wearing an air pack. He'd come out and puke on the front lawn, and then they'd both kind of regroup, and then by now maybe the first guy who'd gone in, puked, would go put on the air pack and go into the building because this air pack was seen as not an initial, uh, an initial tool. This was like only later, only later. Of course, now, I mean, I know certainly my department, and I, I hope your department, <laughs> have changed their thinking on this. You don't go anywhere near a house fire not wearing an air pack, right? Yeah. All, all things evolve as knowledge improves and as conditions change. Yeah, I, th those were... Uh, I like your examples. The, the ventilation example, um, that's that's perfect as far as what I was saying about um, a new technique. kind of hits, um, hits this 
the country, the world, whatever, and, and it kind of flows through, and, and people, uh, some people like it, some people don't. Um, we tried, uh, we call it uh, positive ventilation. So you, you find a house that's full of smoke, and, and there's a fire somewhere in the house. The, 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 the plan was to open the front door, uh, find which window the fire was at, bust it out, and then start up a fan and push all that smoke right through the house and into the, and out the, the and, and that's, that window will just blow out fire. A lot easier mm-hmm. to find the fire because it. The, I mean, the one thing people don't understand is finding a fire is very difficult. Uh, oh, if it's full, the house is full of smoke. We got this. Hollywood has completely screwed it up. Yeah, <laughs> Every, I've I've been a firefighter for uh, fifteen, sixteen years. One time, one time was I in a fire that looked like a Hollywood fire. It, the giant picture window had blown out of the upstairs, yeah. and we were walking around, and it was so cool because we could actually see where the fire was. Oh, we'd walk over here, spray it, walk over here, spray it. And, and we both came out, finally, and we basically put out an entire half of a building or half of a house on fire. And both of us were like, that was so cool. That was just like in the movies. <laughs> Every other time you're crawling around on your hands and knees through smoke, unable to see anything, like, uh, you know, and, and uh, just black smoke everywhere. And, and I, that's a, yeah, like, and the, and the house is generally a mess. And it's, it's it's very challenging to find where the fire is, but this method will help you uh, find the fire minimum. And and there was idea that it would help clean up the air for people who might still be in the house. But uh, you know the idea was experimented with, and and for the city I'm in, and the and the this is not a, an effective way to do things with the type of construction we have, and 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 so. Um, we don't, if if some if I go into a house fire with a with a nozzle and somebody puts a fan behind me and turns it on, uh, we're going to have some troubles after the fire is over because um, the, the, it, nobody else is doing that. You know that window was not broken for me and and it wasn't wasn't going to be safe. So um, you know that's that's a great example of maybe a technique that is good for some people but not others. I don't I don't know if well that's that's a great example because now we in our fire department we don't go into a fire. Without doing that, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Without, and so now there's there are debates as to there are different ways to use the fans, and uh, and there's a big debate about whether to use positive pressure ventilation versus positive pressure attack, and and again, it's more important that everybody's on the same page than it is that you're doing it the right way, because at least you know what you can expect. Yeah. Right? If, if somebody changes the playbook halfway. Uh, that's when you get into trouble. Yeah, that, so we got to drag this back to jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good I don't point. Know if it's possible. Um, I, I, yeah, it just. I mean. I, I, it, it, it's interesting and, and a little bit more in the firefighting because we're talking about it. But uh, if somebody, if you had a student come up to you and, and he or she was interested in the fire service, what, what would you tell them to learn more about it? I'll, I'll broaden that. Okay. I think with anything that you're interested in, it's a shame if you invest years and years and years and thousands of dollars and thousands of dollars and thousands of dollars in something. And then you finally get there and you realize that you hate it. That's awful. Life is short. Resources are scarce. And so you should try to sort of find the smallest possible way to test uh, something. I think that, you know, I often say the key to having good ideas is to have lots of ideas. I've come up with a few jiu-jitsu techniques on my own. So have other people. They come up with the same techniques. But for myself, I invented them. You know, or I discovered them for myself. Yeah. I found out that other people had also discovered it. But for each good technique that I've invented, I've thought of hundreds of bad ones. You know, it's like, okay, that didn't work. Um, and, you know, you find out very quickly <laughs> that's the beauty of jiu-jitsu. So wouldn't it be terrible if you had invested 10 years working on some omoplata setup yeah. that you were pretty sure was going to work, and you've drilled it in kata form for 10 years, you've gone and developed specific strength training exercises to make your legs stronger in that angle, you've thought through every thing of it, you've, you've written it out, now you try it in sparring and it totally doesn't work at all. It, it was a bad idea. 
also, when it comes to firefighting or anything else, I think it's really important to try and figure out what the minimal investment is that you can get some useful information from. I find firefighting really fun. I really enjoy it, as do you, presumably. Yeah. Right? If I didn't still enjoy it, I wouldn't be doing it. Right? It, it, yeah. I ultimately, I do it because it's fun, and I, I don't hate going to work. But other people, it would be their worst nightmare. Right? It, it, they wouldn't like, you know, they might not enjoy dealing with some of the blood and guts aspect. I don't enjoy it, but I'm, I'm happy to help when I can. They might not enjoy the social environment. They might not enjoy the physical challenge. I can't even begin to think of all the reasons why you might not enjoy it. <laughs> so then how do you figure out if, you, if you're going to enjoy something? Many fire departments have ride-along programs, right? We yeah. go and uh, ride with a crew for a day, you know, help out, do chores, uh, do the training, maybe go on some calls, and just get a sense of that. That's a pretty low investment thing. And if it means taking a two-hour bus ride to a different city where they do have a ride-along program, if you're thinking about it, well, you know, that's a day that you would spend. Isn't it better to spend a day and figure out, I really, really like this, or I really, really hate this, um, as opposed to, you know, uh, doing all that training. It, it, it can get really competitive to get into fire departments on the West Coast. I don't know what about the East Coast. I think it's pretty tough. <laughs> Basically, anywhere where it pays a decent wage, it can be tough to get on. Tough to get on can mean spending $100,000 in courses and in opportunity costs, but in lost wages, to assemble all the training. Wow. It, 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 it's, it can be pretty crazy. Um, I, people have spent more than that. And it's not a guarantee, because you're applying, but so are 3,000 of your best friends, or 300 of your best friends, depending how how stringent the criteria are. So there's no guarantee. There are no guarantees. And it's going to be a long, depending where you are, it can be a long, hard process to get on. So you, if you're thinking about it, Go do a ride long. That's pretty low investment. If uh, there are a lot of volunteer departments around that need people to help out, right? When you, you go to calls as a volunteer, you fight fires, you go to car accidents. So it might involve moving to a smaller town which has a volunteer department for six months. Well, that's okay. That's that's again a smaller investment. Plus, it'll look good on a resume. And it's again that whole idea of using a minimal investment before making the commitment. You know, you don't, hopefully, you don't go on a first date with a girl and end up married at the end of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Your investment is, well, okay, let, let's go grab dinner and see if you're completely psycho or not. Yeah. All right, well, she's not psycho on the first date. This is a, you know, this is a good sign. Well, you know, let's um, let's start dating. Again, that's a kind of a, another minimal investment you can walk away from. You know, you're not like, have my baby, please. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Uh, it's not a method that I would advocate. Uh, and, you know, so we do this in other aspects of our life. So I, I think there, there are many ways to find out about firefighting. It, it, you got to enjoy the social component of it. You have to enjoy the physical challenge of it. And you have to enjoy uh, learning. Those, those are the big draws for me, really, is the fact it's a, Every day is a little bit different. Some days are, you know, you, you don't have any calls and you have, you know, an hour or two of training and and there's a whole lot of hanging out. Yeah. Other days, you're, you know, you get to the hall or the station and the alarm goes and you are, by the end of the day, you are completely, absolutely done and you didn't have any lunch and you've been running from one end of your district to the other. And uh, so it, it, if, if you thrive on predictability and <laughs> repeatability, it's probably not a good... Uh, it, it's a great career for people sort of, you know, with ADHD tendencies. <laughs> There's <laughs> always something new and different going on. I think um, I found that uh, doing jiu-jitsu 
has helped me uh, stay relaxed in so stressful situations uh, on the job. I, I think that's one one benefit I've gotten. For, uh, you know, completely. You know, not grappling with a patient that's out of control. Just I seem to be a little more calm and uh, in, in tight spots. I, I completely agree. I, I mean, I think this also just comes down to stress inoculation. Probably your firefighting has also helped your jujitsu. Oh yeah, this is this is a bad situation. Oh well, I I know what I need to do. It might not work, but I know what I need to do. <laughs> oh, I guess I got to tap. You know, it. Any time that you put yourself sort of on the front lines or under sort of a controlled, stressful environment, it helps you, right? I mean, they don't send soldiers out to war anymore by training them to, you know, to do marching. You know, we're going to march in all these fancy formations. No, you're doing as closely simulated training as you can that would simulate a real, a real attack. You know, you're going to be firing guns, there's going to be explosions, there's going to, you know, be chaos. Hopefully it's fairly safe. And really that's what jiu-jitsu is about as well, right? You're simulating the stresses of an encounter as opposed to doing technique number five in kata form. Yeah. You know, against a non-resistant opponent. You're really trying to armbar me. And I'm really trying to armbar you. And it ain't going to look as pretty as it looks if we were doing a two-person kata. But because you're getting used to trying to armbar me against resistance, and I'm getting used to trying to not let you armbar me, with, despite the fact that you're doing your very best, we're getting used to that um, sort of clash of <laughs> clash of wills or clash of intentions or you know cross purposes. So. I think that's ultimately the most important thing. It ties in with something I've said before, which is regardless of whether, let's say you you go and you compete, and your whole game is to pull guard or pull inverted guard, right? You go out there on the mat, and you're going to pull inverted guard. This has a huge self-defense application, and it's not that you're going to, some guy comes out and, tries to punch you outside the bar and you're going to pull inverted guard. Not at all. It's that you're there you're with all your teammates, you're in front of a large crowd, there's people yelling and screaming, and there's some guy there who's doing his best to beat you. So you're again um, inoculating yourself to that stress and, and learning to sort of surf the wave of adrenaline. So now you're outside the bar and some guy decides to take a swing at you. Hopefully, you're not going to pull inverted guard. <laughs> um, <laughs> although, as soon as I say this, somebody will send me a video of some dude pulling inverted guard in a free fight. Uh, but the dealing with the hormonal aspect of it, the stress, the uh, neurophysiological response, which if you, if you, you know, lead an office job, you know, if you, sorry, if you work an office job and lead a sedentary life and you're not picking fights every weekend, you're not going to have this stress in your life, and you're not going to be used to it. Now, all of a sudden, your primitive system goes berserk and dumps the you know, huge amounts of adrenaline and other stress hormones in your system. You won't know what to do, but hopefully the competing, well, training in general and competing in particular, because it's another step up on the stress thing, will help you deal with those stressful situations in real life. Yeah, I, I I agree. It may not be the techniques that you uh, use during competition, but uh, but but being in a form of uh, combat with somebody who's being aggressive and 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 having, like you said, that just in that environment is going to help help prepare you for just to deal with that situation and the stress hormones and things of that nature. A lot of students, uh, we're talking about our jobs. A lot of people have are busy and they can't get the jujitsu all the time. What advice? Uh, would you give to somebody who can only train like twice or maybe three times a week? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, there are a lot of people in that situation. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who keep on getting better in that situation. I mean, I think the first thing is to be realistic. You will not get as good as fast as the rat mat who doesn't have a job and, well, you know, works as a bouncer on the weekend 
but can train twice a day, five days a week, and is also, by the way, uh, 10 years younger than you, and doesn't have kids, right? Like, that's, you cannot compare yourself to those people. Um, you know, uh, there are people who've gotten their black belts in four years, five years, six years, but I can pretty much guarantee you they didn't have kids, a full-time job, yeah, uh, a mortgage, you know, a wife who is going to leave you if you train twice a day, five times a week or six times a week. So, you know, that, that's, that's step one. So given that you've moderated your expectations, hopefully, because you've heard this podcast, uh, what now can you do? Well, really, there, there are several different things. Number one, make the most of your training time, right? You are, when you do get to class, be, you know, have some intent around it, right? Don't just go and roll. Pick something specific. Well, well here's what I do when I have limited training time. I pick a specific aspect of my game. Okay, I'm really focused this month on my deep half guard. Here's a couple of sweeps that I think will work. Let me start every sparring session in the deep half guard. It may not end up there. The guy may pass, and now I'm going to be working my cross-side defense. But yeah. there's, a, there's a theme, right? And by keeping it focused, it, at least I'm going to get better in that one thing. Or if I'm sparring with people who are not as good as I am, I'm only going to try and finish them with the Kimura. That's the only arm lock I'm going to do. I'm not going to, I might have a pretty good knee bar. I might have a pretty good cross choke. I'm, this is, this is Kimura month. Kimura's only. So that just focuses your training. You know, don't sit and gab and chat and, well, train. You're there for training. That's answer one. Yeah. Answer two is there is a lot of stuff that you can do outside of class. Earlier I was saying, you know, for each hour of YouTube you watch, you should be training for two hours. Well, that might not be possible. Maybe you've got a long commute. So you can keep your brain active by watching jiu-jitsu stuff, reading jiu-jitsu stuff. And it's not going to be as effective or as efficient as actually training it, but you're still getting some stuff into your brain. And some people really learn a lot from watching competition. Some people really learn a lot from watching instruction. Some people really learn a lot by reading. If one of those modalities works for you, that's fantastic. Yeah. Another, another thing is if you can do any additional physical fitness, that's really good. If you, you might not be able to go to class more than twice a week, but when you do go to class, if you're gassing out halfway then you're only getting half a class in, really. Yeah. Say that you can add in 20 minutes of running two extra days a week. If you're running at a good clip for 20 minutes, you're not going to become a world-class runner, but you might boost your cardio enough that you don't gas out halfway through the class. Now you can get three-quarters of the way through the class, or maybe all the way through the class without gassing, meaning that you'll be there, you'll be doing more learning during the, t the training time that you do have available to you. Also, even, uh, I think weight training is really important because if you're not training very often, you can afford a training injury even less than the guys who, you know, like if you're now on top of training twice a week, you go and you tweak your shoulder or, you know, hurt your back. Now you're going to be off. It's going to be so discouraging when you come back because you were already at a lower point than you'd like to be. And... Uh, now you had to take two months off. So I think that's where weight training comes in. Weight training is, you know, 10 percent, 25 percent for being more effective on the mat and 75 percent for injury prevention. Uh, it, this is how I think of it now, you know, being in my 40s. Uh, I think, you know, younger guys is 85 percent for looking good at the club, <laughs> 15 percent for, uh, I don't know, taking selfies in the mirror, in the bathroom mirror. Uh, but I, I think doing some sort of additional conditioning, if time is limited, is really important. Maybe you can do that on your own schedule. Maybe you can do that early in the morning, late at night, so long as you're not cutting into your sleep too much. Now, when my kids were young, the thing that saved my life 
for the baby jogger. You know, one of those carts yeah. that you kids, strap your kids into. I'd put them in there. I would run. I'd have like a 20, 25 minute circuit I would do. I'd stop half. I'd, I'd, I'd run out to a point and back. On the way I'd run out, I'd do one set of pull ups, one set of push ups. The kids would start getting cranky. I'd run, turn around, come back, one set of pull ups, one set of push ups, and run home. You know, was I going to win a physique contest during that time? No. Was I in the best shape I was ever in? No. Was I in a little bit better shape than I would have been if I hadn't been doing that? Absolutely. And it just sort of kept the, it sort of kept the mind focused and kept the body just in shape enough to be within striking distance of getting back in a decent shape when you get through that extremely difficult period. In that case, it was having a couple of young children in the house. But it, the same thing would apply to you're an engineer and you've got some massive project that you're going to need up all your time. Well, if you don't fall too far behind, if you can just you know keep a little bit of fitness up, then you're not starting from zero yeah. when that stage of your life is over. You mentioned um, using uh, just learning off the mat, trying to keep up with things. You do have an app, a uh, roadmap for BJJ. That would be a good tool that would help uh, somebody um, not just do random techniques, but actually have a roadmap to help them out. Could you tell me a little bit about I that? Think, sure. Um, and the, it's kind of a roadmap concept. You know, a lot of people start jiu-jitsu and like, what is jiu-jitsu? Well, it's a collection of cool techniques. Yes and no. Yes and no. It, you know, is it the armbar from the guard? Is it the rear naked choke? Well, yes and no. Jiu-Jitsu is inherently a, a positional philosophy, and that doesn't sound very sexy, but it's saying that some positions on the ground are better than other positions. And if you watch two people spar, whether they're white belts, blue belts, brown belts, world champions, whatever, they will spend almost, once in a while they'll end up in really weird positions. This is the minority. Yeah. Most of the time, they're going to be in one of, depending how you count it, six or seven different positions. So I think the low-hanging fruit, sort of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle, yeah. is if you can spend, you know, if you can, if the first thing you learn is the few positions where you're going to be spending most of your time in, then that's a really powerful thing. So, uh, and if for each of those six, say, six positions, depending how you count them, they can be a little bit different. And if you want to call it eight positions, go for it. Um, but let, because uh, it's, because I'm your guest, I'm going to say six. And if for each of those positions, you can learn a couple of ways to escape if you're on the bottom, a couple of ways to advance the position to get to a better position if you're on top, and a couple of ways to attack get an arm lock, get a choke, for each of those positions. It's just a handful of techniques. You're talking, you know, 18, 20 techniques. Now you can flow. Now, no matter where you are, most of the time, you're going to have some kind of idea about where to go next. Or you might not be able to do it. Yeah. You might, you might, you know, I might be rolling with you, and I might know what I need to do, but I might not be able to do it because you're better than I am. That's a separate problem. But at least I'm not completely lost. You know, and I've got a goal now. Like, oh, I've got to figure out how to do a hip escape from side mount when the guy has his hand in the way here. Okay, well, that's a, that's a solvable problem, right? I know what I need to do. just can't quite do it. So now I've got to tweak, as opposed to being completely lost and having no clue as to where I am. So to, to help people with that, there's a, a book I wrote. You can download a copy for free. Uh, Roadmap for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. If you go to grapplearts.com, which is my site, forward slash book, you can download it for free. There's also an app. It's mostly free. <laughs> you can get the basic philosophy and uh, the, the guard positions, bro- a, a breakdown of the guard positions for free. That's for uh, iPhone, iPad, Android, Kindle. If you do a search for Roadmap BJJ app, in you know, the Google Play Store, the Amazon Kindle Store, or the uh, iTunes Store, you'll you'll get there fast enough. You can download it, and you can 
sort of get a basic sense of what I've just talked about, what it actually looks like in real life, right? When, when, when there are two bodies on the mat. So I think that's a useful starting point. I think, uh, from the feedback I've got, it, it's helped a lot of people make sense of this giant jumble of arms and legs. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I experience it on a regular basis. And I'm sure you do too. Even after grappling for decades, you end up in a position, you go, man, I have never been tangled up this way <laughs> before, ever. You know, and, and that's pretty weird. Like, it's not like, um, yeah. you know, it, it's, but it, but that's the minority of the time. Right? And you can say, okay, this is a little bit like this other position. I wonder if this will work. Oh, no, it didn't. Okay, I'm tapping. Yeah, usually <laughs> before that feeling, uh, right after that feeling, you get tapped because that person who's doing that to you knows exactly what they're doing. But uh, <laughs> but I think well, the roadmap... Hopefully you can find a few ways to do that to other people too. Right? <laughs> but, uh... but, but I think that cuts down huge on frustration for new students to have a couple of things to do in each position, whether they work or not, whether they've gotten them figured out very well, at least they get have it. They, they come in and they try to do those techniques as opposed to, you know, if we're um, training this, this month, well, if it's your first, first week, all month, you're going to learn one technique and that's great for the, the school to learn, but uh, you're still going to be confused when, you, when someone's on your back, you know? So yeah, the, uh, to get the a good reverse roadmap. inside out clock choke, you know, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all I need to do is fight my way to the top position and have the other, all I need to do is, uh, pass their guard, have them roll out the turtle, and then I can do this reverse inside out clock choke. Unfortunately, I don't know how to pass guard, <laughs> and I have no way of knowing how to maintain top position on turtle. So, but it's just yeah, that it, easy. <laughs> it, 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 confuse, it, it can be really confusing for new students. It, it, it does take about two or three months for it all to start making sense. And anyone listening here thinking about starting, or if they're in their first couple of months, like take heart. It, it does get better. Uh, maybe not as fast as you would like, though. But it does get better. I think so. Yeah. Stefan, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Could you tell us how we could keep up with you and, and uh, keep track of what you're doing? Well, uh, the, the Facebook, which would be facebook.com slash grapplearts. There would be the website, which is grapplearts.com. And then there's also the uh, the email newsletter, which has got a a lot of content, and if, if you don't like what I send you, there's an unsubscribe link at the bottom of every single email, so the easiest way to sign up for that one is graphlouse.com forward slash book. I'm also on the Twitter and the, uh, the Reddit, but you can get all to, you can get to there through the, uh, the website. Also YouTube, but as you pointed out, I've got a fair bit of stuff on there. If you do a search for my name, you'll find me fast enough. Sounds good, and I'll put links to those on the show notes for everybody to help uh, find them if they haven't found you already. So uh, thanks for helping on here with us. And, well, uh, thank you so much, Byron, and I'm glad uh, we, we went off on a few digressions there, but hopefully that was all right. I think so. I, uh, I know I enjoyed it, and, uh, and I, whenever you have two people talking about something that they're passionate about, I think it's usually fun to listen to. Okay. So Have a great day. You too. Now, uh, I hope you all enjoyed the uh, interview there with Stephen Casting. Um, some great advice. One thing I really liked was, when he was talking about your instructor is going to teach you, you know, the moves, your instructor is going to be the one who's going to show you the moves. But what's really more important is the learning environment of the GM versus, you know, just the instructor, you know, knowing all the moves. You, you have to be in a good environment in the GM for that to really soak in and for you to really become the best you can be. I thought that was a great piece of, you know, great, talking about that part great advice yeah it's it's great to have an instructor that has a ton of knowledge and uh, we've been fortunate with that Gary uh, but it's also great and we're also fortunate to have uh, an atmosphere a team that of people that you train with and training partners that are going to probably teach you uh, more in the long run you know and really help you fine-tune techniques than just one instructor could uh, teaching a group of 30 people or so uh, it's really yeah. you learn a lot from your teammates yeah you think about how much skill level is in your, your room there, in your training room. You've got probably, you know, high-level wrestlers. You've got some, you know, traditional martial artists. You might have a Japanese jiu-jitsu guy. You might have an Aikido person. 
but you can learn a little bit from every every one of those per- people. You know, I've learned from just average wrestlers about head positioning. I mean, we're not talking, you know, national champion wrestlers. I'm just talking an average high school wrestler who has helped me tremendously, you know, with head positioning and stuff like that. And, and your training partners, plus your coach's knowledge, and, uh, and an atmosphere where I've seen gyms where you really can't ask questions. So, you know, uh, how do I how do I not get get put in this move over and over again? And I've actually heard an instructor say before, don't get put there. And they go on to the next thing. I mean, really, what does that do for me? I need to know I'm going to get put there. I need to know how to get out of that. I need to know, you know, know from either my instructor or my my training partner. So you have to have a free and open environment where people are not afraid to ask questions, won't feel stupid, and uh, it just uh, promotes learning. There's a huge difference in in uh, in the outcome of the students in that sort of environment, and uh, it's it's uh, I mean, everybody appreciates a great coach. But you you look at the environment that a great coach look at Frangia, look at the environment he makes at, at his school. He can't he can't be responsible for teaching everybody every technique they learn. They're learning from each other. You know, he may have started yeah. it and, and and keep it going and, and controls the attitude of the people who are in there somewhat, but. But it's the the team that really keeps that engine going. So that's that's a g- great concept that we talked about uh, with Stefan. So really appreciate that uh, that idea and knowledge that he was sharing today. Yeah. And uh, Stefan, you're going to learn so much from that guy. So like we said earlier, uh, check out his uh, his website grapplearts.com. Uh, a lot of great stuff there. So uh, um, you know he's you can keep learning from him. So check out his stuff, and uh, I guarantee you'll learn. Another great resource we do we have our audio book, but he has a uh, a roadmap for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and uh, that that's also a that's a valuable resource for anyone who's new at Jiu Jitsu. Um, swing by there uh, and check it out. I'll put links to that on the show notes as well. It's a great resource for anybody, but it's definitely going to help you uh, help you if you're new, like like we're, like a lot of people that we're helping today. Um, he's he's a great resource for that as well. So definitely check that out. Um, it might be right up your alley. Uh, on that one, uh, Gary, this was episode ninety-four. Can you believe it? Ninety-four. You know what that means? Seven more, and we're at a hundred. But uh, you, see, Gary's. I'm not so good with numbers. Gary's good with numbers. He's a numbers guy. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm a banker. So yeah, ninety-four <laughs> plus seven is a hundred. Dang man, that's pretty good. We're not there yet, yeah. but we're getting close, yep. buddy. Yeah, someday, Byron. Someday. We, we should do something big for our hundredth episode. I had a had an idea come to me today that uh, that might work out. You know, you never tell me these episodes till we get on air. Or your <laughs> not episodes, your ideas. Let's hear your idea. Okay, um, episode one hundred. It's going to be uh, a lot of fan content, as in listeners. If you want to uh, deliver maybe a little five minute message to us about what jiu-jitsu has done for you. We would love to hear that. We would love to share that story with the rest of the listening audience. And I think it will be a very motivating episode as far as keeping, you know, if you're a little on the fence or you're, if you're frustrated with jiu-jitsu, it does so much more for you than to just make you better at jiu-jitsu. Um, it, I think it'll be a lot of great stories that people could share. So the easy way, uh, I don't know what the easiest way would be, but uh, our email is bjjbrick at gmail.com. If you want to share a story with us, you could email us and we'll get a hold of you and, and get your get about five minutes worth of story. If you want to, probably the easier way for us would be if you would send us an audio file. Uh, most phones today have a have a little note, uh, audio memo note. You could record MP3 with your phone. Go to a quiet room. Have have a little you know, bullet points of what you want to say. Uh, kind of ready to go, and just go for it. Tell us in about five minutes or less what Jiu-Jitsu has done for you, and uh, and then email us that audio file, and we'll piece them together and, and be able to play them uh, for a show 100. Byron, that is an awesome idea. I mean, really, 100 episodes, who would ever thought we'd get there? And uh, the only reason we got there is uh, because of our listeners. Uh, that's that's why we do it. It's uh, We always talk about how neat it is when we hear somebody give us a review, a positive review. It makes us feel like we're doing something worthwhile. And uh, this one here, it's all about the uh, all about the listeners, all about the fans. So uh, 
uh, let's, I like your idea including them in there. Yeah, I'm excited to do it. Um, if, if you send us an audio file, odds are we're going to use it, you know, unless you're, you're, you're in a helicopter, which Gary spends a lot of time in his helicopter, but try to get somewhere quiet and don't run the chainsaw, uh, you know, try, try to not be at NASCAR at the, at the moment when you're recording this, get somewhere quiet. Record the the file and then email it to us. Or if that can't work out, send us an email and we'll try to get with you and uh, record a little segment with you. I'd love to add all these up. It would be great if the show was a, a long show. You know, that would be kind of fun to have a whole bunch of stories of how important Jiu-Jitsu is um, to everybody. And then we could, you know, you could send this to your friends and say, hey, I'm on this show. That's exactly what I was thinking. We, we were just talking about sharing it with your, uh, talking about sharing it with your buddies. Tell your buddies about the show. You can say, now you will be able to say, Hey, you want to listen to me uh, on a podcast? Here I am. I'm the man, the myth, <laughs> the legend. I'm on a podcast. But more so importantly, more importantly than them learning how big, how great you are, is they're going to learn how great jujitsu is as they listen to story after story uh, of how how much jujitsu has helped somebody. It's going to be like a commercial for jujitsu. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, really, that's what jujitsu is all about. Jujitsu, it seems like once you start, it becomes a lifestyle. It does so much for you. It makes you smile. It makes you positive. It makes you happy. Um, on top of, you know, learning the techniques, uh, you meet a lot of great people. Um, you know, you always, there's, normally in every school, there's guys that used to weigh 350 pounds and now weigh 150. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lifestyle. It, it's, uh, um, every time people start talking about jujitsu, everybody starts smiling because they have such a great time doing it and talking about it. So, uh, uh, great positive messages. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward. We got a few episodes between here and there. Um, the idea may change slightly, but I think that's the that's that's a great episode 100, and uh, and that puts us almost at two year mark. We've done the episode every week uh, for since we started. So at uh, what's yeah. the math on that, Gary? How many weeks have we got there? Well, you figure there's 52 weeks in yeah. a year, so the two year mark would be 107. <laughs> so, uh, you know, episode 107 will be two years. It'll be, you know, uh, two years worth of episodes, 52 in a year. Wow. And that's, uh, and you're the one that's better at math. So yeah, yeah. Right on. Yeah, I was a math major, too. A mathematician. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh. But we're coming I mean, right up on the two-year mark. The movie. You might have seen the movie about me, uh, the true story about me. It's called Good Will Hunting. That was you. Yeah, oh, I wasn't the guy who solved all the math problems. Oh. I was the guy who got beat up on the playground. <laughs> but that was before I knew jiu-jitsu, when it happened like that today. There we go. Now everybody knows. Yeah. Now the secret's out, Gary. We didn't even get to episode 100 before you let that big secret out. Yeah, yep. So, that's fun. But we are yeah. looking forward to getting your stories. We'll collect them up, and we'll uh, I'll edit everything together. Uh, make you sound as good as possible, and uh, and you'll have something you could you could share with uh, your friends, and you could be you could share with the community, and you know maybe there's somebody out there who's doing jujitsu and they're a little frustrated and thinking about quitting, and you share with with them your story about how it's helped you on or off the mat and how you've accomplished something or or the way it's changed you, and uh, it could be very inspirational. I think this will be a, this will be good for everybody. Definitely looking forward to episode 100. It's going to be a special episode. Yep. Next week, Gary, we have a uh, a legend in the sport of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's one of the original Dirty Dozen, which means uh, one of the first non-Brazilian black belts. Yep, and so a dozen is 13? I think that's a, that's a, a baker's dozen. I, nobody's believing my, uh, <laughs> you know, that I'm good with numbers. Well, it's just... Uh, you got to be able to produce the results. It's like jujitsu. The truth uh, you is painfully obvious. Obvious. I'm definitely not a black belt in numbers. <laughs> not a white belt. Uh, might be a white belt. But we've got uh, next week. We have an interview with David Meyer. He's he's been doing jujitsu for a long time. One of the first uh, non-Brazilians to get a black belt, and he's still competing. So he's uh, he's got a lot to share. He's he's an active competitor. Besides being an active competitor, he also runs the world's largest nonprofit uh, pet adoption service. And we'll talk a little bit about that, and, and it's one of his passions. But a lot of jiu-jitsu uh, from his years of experience and his years of competing. And he shares some stories about uh, about stepping on the mat and, and about coaching and about um, you know dealing with your body as it gets older and, and still competing. So uh, a lot of fun talking, talking with David Meyer, and uh, you'll get to hear it next week. Perfect. 
Yep, can't wait for that one. Uh, we also, a fun way to get a hold of us is Facebook. Go by a like our page. We also have a Twitter account. Gary, I feel bad about Twitter. Um, my phone doesn't ding when I get a Twitter a tweeted at me. So I'll, uh, I'll go on there like, yeah, I'll go on there like once a week and they'll have like, I'll have people retweeting stuff. And I'm like, okay, man, that's cool that we're getting some, you know, getting some activity on there. But I don't see it right away. You know, if somebody messages us on Facebook, we see it right away. You know, it's kind of fun. You know, we, but we're just as grateful for any Twitter love we get, we get. But, uh, I don't know why I need to set up the notifications, I guess, is my problem. But uh, Yeah. Uh, one choke at a time, right, Gary? Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, when people listen this long to the show, they're always waiting to hear about Gary's next audiobook that he has coming out. Oh, here it comes again. <laughs> Gary, I know you've been working hard at this audiobook. Um, the title, all I know is the title, and, and, and you're almost done with the book already. It's called... Well, yeah, a lot of audiobooks coming out. <laughs> I know it's it's uh you get to that point where you're like 95% done completed with the book and then for some reason you just don't yeah, I never finish it. Yeah. But th- I know this one's going to be a big hit with everybody. Okay. It's called Hammer Let me Time. Know what it is. Yeah, it's it's called Hammer Time. Why I still wear hammer pants and how it's helped me uh survive some deadly situations. The title says it all right there. You know, first of all, hammer pants are stylish. I mean, who doesn't like somebody wearing gold hammer pants? I mean, they're just good-looking shoes or good-looking pants. I mean, imagine with a pair of shoes, you're good. But how it has helped me in survive situations. You know what I can fit in those hammer pants? I can fit knives, <laughs> swords, bricks, microphones, AK-47s. I mean, you can fit anything in the hammer pants. So I'm telling you, if you when I'm walking down the street, and people see me in hammer pants. It's funny because people always are smiling and snickering, and actually most people are laughing, like fall over laughing. They're, you know, laughing so hard they start crying. I, I don't know what it is. But it seems like that happens when I walk past them with hammer pants on. <laughs> but nobody has ever tried to rob me while wearing <laughs> hammer pants because they know I, I could be packing big time. So uh, don't mess with a guy wearing hammer pants. Do you ever feel that that the people who are not attacking you and trying to get your your wallet assume you don't have any money? You know why rob that guy? He's got nothing. No, not with hammer pants. I mean, hammer pants are classics. I mean, they, and you know what classic means? Cost more money. <laughs> Vintage. You know, it's a, that's true. That's the definition of classic. I mean, normally I, I I really do wear my hammer pants and my uh, members only jacket most places I go. So. Uh, I do attract a lot of attention. You know what I'm thinking as we explain this? That we're both, um, we're not, we're not necessarily spring chickens anymore. So, uh, no. there's a good group of people who are under 30 that may not know what a hammer pants is. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, hey, you know what we'll do, Byron? What will we, we do? We will put a link to it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Just call us the link, Lincoln. Lincoln Logs, the Lincoln right. Nators. I, I will yeah, find people a probably link. don't know what Lincoln Logs either. <laughs> if they're not old enough, so we'll have to put those on there too. I will. I will find a link to MC Hammer uh, doing his thing on YouTube, and I'll put a link to that at the very bottom. If you want to be, if you don't understand the joke at all, you probably should be a little more cultured than that and learn who MC Hammer was and check out those pants. Yeah, I, I think most people are going to know what I MC hope Hammer so. pants. But. But, uh, well, and they can knows? save your life. Uh, I know, Gary, your triangle, I cannot get out of your triangle if you're wearing MC Hammer pants. Well, the good thing is you can throw a triangle on with the MC Hammer pants, and then you can do a basically a collar silk because you can grab onto your pants. I mean, there's <laughs> so much to grab onto. I can wrap that thing around. I mean, a loop choke. I can do loop chokes, collar chokes. I can do all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's like a super gi. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, a super gi. We're on the they rip easier. Yeah, we're on the sun. But then yeah. I just put a. Then what I do is, as soon as I rip my MC Hammer pants, I just put a BJJ brick patch over the rip, and uh, Allah, voilà, it's fixed. How'd you get that gi patch, Gary? You want to know how I got that gi patch, Byron? <laughs> what I did is I went on to uh, iTunes and uh, I gave BJJ Brick a review, not just a regular review, a funny review, and uh, they really like funny reviews, is what I've been told. And then I sent them an email. I can either send it a message on the Facebook page or I can send an email to bjjbrick at gmail.com. And I put, hey, that was me who gave the review. My, my screen name was uh, MC Hammer Pants. So I was like, hey, I'm MC Hammer Pants. I'm the one who gave you that five-star review. And the next thing I know, they asked for my address. 
and a uh, geek pack showed up a couple days later because I live in the United States. They, they told me if I lived out of the United States, they uh, can't pay shipping for outside the United States. But yeah, so uh, that's how you to get a BJ, BJJ brick key patch. And Gary, we do have four reviews in for last month. Uh, I get all the reviews oh, emailed sweet. to me at the end of the at the end of the month, so I. I don't check it every day, but every month we get the email and we get to see them, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I want to thank a TX Traveler and uh, Logically Insane. And I Gim- like Logically Insane. That's a cool name. And Gimrick as well for writing us reviews. Also got a, a review from Comrade. He says, the early nerd gets the choke. A uh, very informative Ooh. podcast. So thanks for that. That's and, uh, a good one. So thank you. All those, early. all those are five-star reviews. Um uh, we really appreciate those and, and we read them and, and uh, get encouraged by, by seeing those as well so uh, any of you guys uh, who wrote those reviews send me an email at bjjbrick at gmail.com and we'll be happy to uh, help you uh, patch up the holes in your key with our little key patch yeah or your MC Hammer pants <laughs> whatever you could use it with yeah. So, uh, yeah it's been a lot of fun this week and we do look forward to uh, getting back with you in one week's time We'll have David Meyer next week. Uh, uh, won the original Dirty Dozen, which is twelve, and uh, uh, founder of the largest uh, pet adoption agency. So definitely uh, uh, stay tuned next week. And uh, as always, we really appreciate you tuning in. And don't forget to get sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's awesome. And Gary, we do have uh, four gi... Uh, damn it. <clears throat> Hold on a second. <clears throat>